First Timothy chapter number four, and I want to draw your attention to the latter portion of that chapter, verses eleven through sixteen. First Timothy chapter four, and then one verse in the book of James. So if you can find James chapter number one as well. James chapter one and verse twenty one and then first Timothy chapter number four and we'll begin reading in verse eleven of first Timothy chapter number four. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, that is, in the manner of your life, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation or preaching, and to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Notice, give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. In James chapter number 1 and verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, that is, the excess of uh, uh, sinfulness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, listen, which is able to save your souls. So I want to preach to you now on the subject, uh, things we still have to face after salvation, there are still things the Bible says we have to face uh, to be delivered from, saved from, quote-unquote. And so we want to try to talk to you about some of those things tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of meeting uh, together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do pray, God, that you would help us. We've seen many Christians that were young would stumble... Uh, because after their deliverance from sin and the pardon and forgiveness that they received in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they didn't realize that there were still some things that they would have to face and endure and even uh, have faith to, uh, to go through. And so we pray, God, that you would help us to have the wisdom that we need, that no matter what we face in this life, that we might continue to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and to love Christ. Lord, I pray especially for those who are facing difficulties during their life in these days. Lord, help them to see that Jesus still is the answer and help them to have the faith and confidence in Christ that they need. Lord, make the message clear. Uh, Lord, help people to understand it to, according to the teaching of your word and help us, Lord, uh, not to uh, confuse anyone or cause them any difficulty, uh, but Lord, help them to see things even clearer because of the work and ministry of your Holy Spirit. God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we pray that you'd answer it according to your promises. Amen. Well, when you read that little phrase in the Bible, save yourselves, I don't want you to misunderstand. Shani, sit up. Don't be laying like that. Uh, Jesus is not, or the Bible is not teaching us that we have any part in our redemption, our salvation. I remember witnessing to a man once who really thought that after you are converted or saved, that uh, you had to then maintain your salvation or save yourself by your effort and good works. And I said, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that you are to save yourselves. 
And he said, yes, it does. It says it in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number um, 40-something. And I turned over to that passage that he mentioned, and then I thought, well, that's not talking about Bible salvation, being saved from sin. Listen to what Acts 2 verse 40 says. And with many other, th- other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this from this untoward generation. It's not talking about saving yourselves from your sin, saving yourselves from the wrath of God. He's saying, listen, you respond to the gospel and be delivered from this wicked world that you're living in. So I don't want to confuse you. There's only one way that we're saved, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And the Bible is really clear about that over and over again, all throughout the Bible, tells us that only Jesus can save us. Only He can forgive us. Only Christ can pardon us. He's the only one that can rescue and deliver us from our sins. If you want to get to heaven when you die, there's only one way, and that's through what Christ did for you on the cross. And coming to Jesus and accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Nobody else can change your heart. In fact, you cannot even change your own heart. Amen? That takes the power of God to make you a new person in Christ Jesus. To make you a new creature. Only Jesus can do that. One of the verses I point to often is John in chapter 14 in verse number 6. And Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is saying there are not many uh, sides up the mountain of salvation, and one side is Christ, another is Buddha, another is Muhammad, another is good works. Choose whatever side you want. We all get to the top salvation after our lives. Anyway, Jesus is not saying that. He's saying there's only one way to get into a right relationship with God. And that is through what God did for us on the cross of Calvary. Earlier in John, Jesus wrote this, uh, John wrote this in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, Jesus said, for in them you think you have eternal life, and notice this, and they are they that testify of me. Not of... uh, not of something you might do to redeem yourself. Jesus said, I want you to take your Bible. Go through every page. Search the Scriptures. And you'll find out that the testimony of, of the Scriptures is our, our desperate need of Christ. We need Jesus to save us from our sins. Listen to what Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says. Neither is there salvation in any other by the way, that you can put in any other, you can put your in there also that, that include yourselves, amen? <laughs> There's not salvation in any other, including yourself. You can't save yourself. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And think what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Are you with me? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Amen? It is the gift of God, not of works, verse 9, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a free gift, and all you can do with a gift is either receive that gift or reject that gift, right? If you're going to be saved, you must receive Christ, accept the gift that God has given to you eternal life through His Son. These are the only, this is the only way of ever being saved. And, and if you're sitting here tonight thinking, one day I'm going to be saved, one day I'm going to, I'm going to become a Christian, and I'm, going to, I'm going to really get right with God, it's going to be the same tonight as at any other time in your life. If you're going to be saved, you must come to Christ and ask Jesus to save you, and Christ will indeed save you from your sins. Amen? But these passages recorded in 1 Timothy and James chapter number 4 are not passages that are contradicting that statement. 
He's not saying Jesus saves and then here a lot of stuff left over for you to do. And so he saved you from your sins, now you save your souls. He's not teaching that. He's teaching us that even as saved people, we're still going to face a lot of problems and difficulties in life. We're still going to find troubles and trials. We're still going to go through some very deep valleys. Amen? As believers, as Christians, we're going to face some hard days. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that life is now going to become an easy road and you're going to have no problems whatsoever. And I do believe that a lot of people are being confused about this in our day. I think so often the some people that have been converted, they've been saved. And not long after that, they come to me and they say, Brother Tommy, it's harder now. It's, it's a little more difficult now. It's, I didn't realize that there would be a battle now. And I can assure you there's always going to be conflict in your soul. You're either going to be warring against God, right? Resisting what He wants to do in your life and saying no to Him and fighting God, or you're going to be warring against the devil, right? I mean, that's the way life is. Either you're going to be resisting God's will for your life, or you're going to be resisting Satan's effort to get you derailed off the Christian walk. And so you're never going to find a place in this world where you're in neutral. Nobody bothers you. There's no such place in this life. Either you're going to be fighting God, or you're going to be resisting the devil. So what are some things that we're still going to face? And I hope that you understand the terminology. Then that means I'm not saved from suffering. I can be saved from my sins and the penalty of sin, and I can be justified with God that is just if, is, as if I had never sinned, but that doesn't mean I'm saved from suffering in this world. And I want to remind you, if you want to give this some serious thought, all you have to do is go back and look at the life of Christ. Christ Jesus lived in this world, and he never sinned one single time. But he didn't live a life that was a life of ease, a problem-free life, a trouble-free life, did he? No, not at all. Christ faced a lot of suffering while he lived in this world. And so, as a Christ follower, guess what I should anticipate? I should anticipate that as Christ uh, endured sufferings, he endured difficulties, guess what I'm going to be called to do? I'm going to be called to also endure sufferings and difficulties and problems, right? Because we are to pattern our life after the life that our Lord Jesus Christ Lived. In fact, when Peter is teaching on this, and you have to remember, in the Bible days, it's, it was something similar to what our brothers and sisters are facing in our day to day. And in Muslim countries today, when Christianity is being somewhat uh, hunted, hunted down, uh, it wasn't long ago in Egypt, there was another bombing and murdering of Christians. And you hear those reports, not as often as we should, but, uh, but if you go online, you'll see Christians are being attacked and Christians are suffering. And that's the type of atmosphere that Christians in the early days lived under. They didn't live under a place of no violence, no problems, no persecutions whatsoever. They lived in days of suffering and difficulty. And guess what? Those suffer that time of suffering did not drive them away from Jesus. Guess what it did? It drove them closer to Christ. Really that's what suffering should do for every true believer. I didn't come to God just so he would uh give me a life free from problems. If that's why you want to be saved, let me promise you something. You don't want the salvation the Bible's offering. I came to him because I wanted forgiveness for my sins and I did not want to spend eternity in hell. And uh, I know that in this world, in this life, 
there are going to be difficulties and I'm going to have to face some problems even though that I'm a saved man. Amen? And so listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at verses 19 through 21. For this is thankworthy, that's acceptable. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, that is beaten, physically beaten for your faults, you should take it patiently. You've done something wrong and you, you, you received a beating. You say, okay, I'm going to just endure this beating because I did something wrong. He said, wait a minute. You, you were found at fault with that. But notice what he goes on to say. But if when you do well and suffer for it, yet take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. I didn't go out here and do wrong and then face a, face a beating because of my wrong. I did good and I was beaten because of the good and I did not fight back, but I accepted this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me. And God said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's how I want you to respond to abuse and persecution and suffering in this world respond to it like Christ responded to it. Amen? Talk about spiritual maturity and development. Look at verse 21. For even hereunto were you called. You realize that? That we've not only been called to salvation, but we've been called to suffer. You don't hear that much in preaching, do you? You know why? Because not many people want to run to suffering... No, we want to run to a life that's free from suffering, but we don't want to run to a life that is full of suffering. But he said, this is the life that you're called to. If this world hated Jesus, guess what? It's going to hate Christ's followers too, amen? If they hated Jesus, they certainly are not going to love those that love him. And so you might as well accept that in this world you're going to face ridicule persecution and sufferings for even here and too were you called because Christ also suffered for us listen leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps look at verse number 22 who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled reviled not again. They railed on Christ. And guess what Christ did? He did not rail against them. They accused him of all types of blasphemy and ridiculed him. And he did not ridicule them in return. And he said, this is the response that we're called to as well. We're called to not rail against this world that rails against us. When he suffered, he threatened not. Look at this last statement, verse 23 of 1 Peter 2. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. That's a great verse, isn't it? God, you know what's going on. I'm not going to fight this. You're the judge of all the earth. You know what's right. I want to just be a follower of Christ. And God is well pleased with those who are willing to suffer for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So suffering could include anything from physical pain to persecution to difficulties in this life. Remember in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 it says this about our Lord. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. When you think of Jesus, you think sometimes, wow, what a wonderful person Jesus is. He walked on water. He fed the hungry. He he uh, healed those that were sick. But listen to this also. He suffered and suffered and suffered. He was ridiculed. He was rejected. He was called every name under the sun. He was laughed at and scorned. And yet he lived faithfully to please his heavenly Father and to obey him. Amen? And that's what we're called to do as well. We're called to be faithful even in suffering. And the only way that we're going to save ourselves from not 
acting like the world and behaving like the world is that we mature and develop and grow so that we can become more Christ-like that even in the hottest times of suffering, we can have a Christ-like spirit about us. Amen? You're not going to be able to act like Christ if you don't take this Word of God and make it a part of your life and engraft it in and, and be transformed and grow and develop. You're just a... Uh, some of us are just a, a step or two away from if someone slapped us in the face, knocking them out, right? <laughs> How would you respond if somebody slapped you in the face? Most of us say, I'd knock them out. That means we haven't gone very far in our spiritual maturity and development. And so salvation does not save us from suffering. Listen, it does not save us from sorrow either. I don't know how many of us have faced great grief after being converted. Amen? And we're not promised that we're going to be spared any sorrow after that we're saved. In fact, you know that's not the case. Amen? <laughs> How many of God's greatest the saints have we saw suffer and go through sorrow, right? Great sorrow. The loss of a loved one. The loss of a child. The loss of a husband or wife. You see, just because that you are a follower of Christ doesn't mean that you're going to be saved from all sorrow. No more tears here in this world. That's not what the Bible promises, is it? It promises no more tears up there. <laughs> right? Up there He'll wipe away all our tears. Up there there'll be no more sorrow. Up there there'll be no more suffering. But while we're living in this present world, there are going to be bucketfuls of tears. There are going to be sorrows that we face all around us. And that's what this life is like. And don't expect just because you're saved never to weep again. Amen? Remember our Lord, one of the greatest uh, little verses in the Bible is found in John chapter 11, verse 35. It simply says this, Jesus wept. There he's weeping at the funeral of a friend, a close friend. And the Bible says about that situation, it touched the heart of Jesus so much to see the brokenness of others that he wept with them. Well, let me tell you another time that our Lord wept hours before the cross. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way that men could be saved, Lord, let this, the, the fact that I'm about to become sin, the substitute for man's sin, Lord, let it pass. And the Bible says that he wept. He wept. He was full of grief. It was such a severe time that it was, is a, it was as great sweat drops of blood flowed from the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Talk about agony. Talks about, talk about the, uh, the, the depth of just sorrow in his heart. That's what our Lord endured. Don't expect that you're going to now be a Christian and never shed a tear. That's insanity. Don't listen to this wicked church generation that says, now that you're saved, you don't have to worry about anything. You're not going to find that in your Bibles. Amen? We've heard all kinds of just sorrowful stories. We've known people that have gone through some great dark valleys of sorrow and they were Christians when they faced those valleys. Amen? One of my best friends, he had an older sister and she was in Bible college and in Bible college she started having severe headaches and her dad at that time was the president of the Bible college and they found out that his daughter had brain cancer and she ended up dying, passing away because of that cancer. Here he is, he's a, he's a pastor, here he is, he's a preacher, here he is, he's a president of a Bible college 
But does that keep them from having to look on his daughter as she's going through some of the most horrible things that a person could ever go through? No, it did not. Just because you're saved don't mean that you're not going to have sorrow in your heart. Amen? And I don't like mentioning some of these things, but we know of Christians who have suffered miscarriage. We, we know Christians who have suffered the loss of children at birth. Some have buried their, their babies, their little babies. They buried them. And you hear story after story all across the world of people who have lost their children. Remember the video here we uh, watched at uh, our church about the missionary on the mission field that had to hold his own son in his arms and watch his son die because there was not sufficient medicine on the mission field to, to save his son, died in his arms as he was rushing to the hospital. Remember that story? Here's a Christian man on the mission field in a, in a part of the world doing everything he could to serve God, and yet what did he have to face? He had to face sorrow of sorrows. Are we to fool ourselves and think that down the road we might not have to face like sorrows? That would be insanity, wouldn't it? I know none of us would look for that. None of us want that. No, no one desires that. But when it comes Realize this, if it comes, we have a friend that sits closer than a brother. Our Lord would never uh, forsake us, never leave us. He will carry us through even the darkest valleys that we've ever faced. Amen? Some Christians have been raped. Some have been murdered. Anything that can happen to the unsaved man, listen to me, can also happen to the saved man. Isn't that right? And so how are we going to respond if something awful, sorrowful like that happens to us in our life? What is our response? Is it to get angry with God or be bitter against God? No! If you don't mature and develop, that might be your wrong response to Him, wouldn't it? And it would be a wrong response to get angry or bitter with God because that uh, things like that happen in our world that's so full of rejecting God's will and not doing those things that God commands. And so Christians are not saved from sorrow. We're neither, neither are we saved from sickness. Isn't that true? We've seen some of our best Christian friends here in this church, Ms. Sister Tina. It's amazing that you have to even stop and think about the fact that she's in heaven now. Isn't that true? Who used to come so regular, so consistent, sitting in church, worshiping, and just enjoying her being here, bringing her family, bringing her children, bringing her grandbabies to church. Amen? goes to the doctor and she's feeling well. The doctor begins to do an examination. And they find that she has stage 4 cancer already. And listen, and only God knows what's going on in our bodies. None of us really know that, do we? I hope that all of us are just as healthy as we can be. But none of us knows if we're near a heart attack or leaving this world in just a moment. One of the things about Father's Day, it makes you think about people who no longer have their father with them as well, doesn't it? And Brenda's side of the family, there was a, a cousin of hers that lost a husband this past year who was just 50 years old, 51 years old. 50 years old. 50 years old. His son in Bible college. As healthy as anybody, young, athletic, didn't seem like he had any physical problems at all, and then all of a sudden he's gone. He's out of this world. It's shocking. Should we get angry with God when something like that happens? No. 
Because that's exactly the way God said we're to anticipate our lives to be in this world, isn't it? We never know. I remember my friend Billy Bevan Jr. pastoring up in Georgia, Camden Free Will Baptist Church, had uh, two young brothers attending his church. And, and uh, God really started dealing with those boys' heart. And one of them said that he wanted to be a preacher of the gospel. And so they were getting, the church was gathering funds and getting ready to send him off to Bible college. And then he just started feeling weakness in his body. And it's unusual for such a young man that started taking him to see the doctor and found out that he had MS. And as a teenager, he learned that the rest of his life he's going to have to face the difficulty of that disease plaguing his body. And you say, well, I guess he didn't go to Bible college, did he? No, he went on to Bible college. <laughs> and just because you're facing some kind of sickness in this world doesn't mean that life stops. You know, God has an amazing way of taking those weaknesses and sicknesses and still if we serve him he's able to show others how great he is if if someone who's going through all of this is still willing to serve me how embarrassing is that to us who are not facing those problems and trials amen are y'all understanding what i'm saying save yourselves it's not talking about you shedding blood and bringing about redemption. It's saying, listen, grow to a place that when you go through these trials that you don't get sidetracked. You don't turn your back on Jesus. You stay faithful. You serve God. You love God. No matter what you face in this world, remember, this life is just a short time here. We don't have long here. And then we go off, we step off into eternity. And we want to step off into the in heaven itself, not in the flames of hell. Amen? And Christ is the one that saves us from hell and eternal damnation. But we're not to let sickness get us sidetracked. Let me say lastly this evening, I'm not saved from sin's temptations. I know some young people that I remember a young man who made a profession of faith, probably about nine or ten years old, he used to ride the van years ago. And he prayed and made a profession of faith and and it came to church the next few Sundays and we didn't see him for a while. And then all of her, all of a sudden I heard the kids were talking about him. He said that uh that he had sinned. And so there was just no reason now going to church anymore since he sinned after he got saved. And somehow Satan honestly convinced him, you just blew it. You ruined it. You're saved and now you went off and done something bad. You're never going to go to heaven when you die. Can I say something to you? That's absolutely untrue. Saved people are still tempted to sin. You say, preacher, how do you know these things? Well, Christ was tempted. Amen? You look at all these things I've mentioned to you. Other than sickness, how many would you agree with me tonight? Christ faced all of those things. Did he face suffering? Did he face sorrow? Did he face sins, temptations? Yes, 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 he did, didn't. And so if he endured those things, guess what we are to anticipate? We are to face like manner things. And we are called to respond the way Christ responded. Amen? That no matter what troubles, trials, valleys, uh, 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 terrible things we might face, that we continue to pursue the one who created us and we continue to live for Christ. Amen? In fact, can I tell you something? Even after salvation, you're going to fall flat on your face. The only one who never sinned was the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Amen? But guess what? Every saved person here, I promise you, if you could get us all just to, you know, bear our hearts and lay aside all pridefulness, all of us would have to stand with shame-faced at this and said, I have done things after my salvation 
that I am just embarrassed to share with you, but these are some of the things that I did since being saved. i never will forget that after I was saved, I really thought the night that I was saved that I would never have to worry about sin again. I know that's foolish. I know that's uh, ignorant. I know that. But that's exactly how I felt. The night I got saved, I didn't want to sin ever again. I didn't want anything to do with sin. And it went long after that that I realized, man, I still have a sin problem. I'm still tempted to do things that I should not do. And I had to learn as a young Christian, just because I failed, it didn't mean that I'd lost my salvation or that God was never going to have anything to do with me again. I had to learn 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I can't tell you how many times I've had to pray, Lord, I can't even number all my sins, but would you please just wash me clean again? Forgive me. I can't enumerate them. I can't confess them all. To the best of my ability, I've laid them before you, but there are probably a multitude of things that I don't even know that's there. Lord, would you please remove those sins and wipe the slate clean again. I'm sorry that I've not lived like I ought to live before you. But I'm so glad that when we sin, we don't lose our salvation, aren't you? Isn't that good news? I love to think of a husband and wife relationship when I think of salvation. When people are young and they're attracted to one another, there's nothing like that person they're attracted to. Right? They don't see any faults, no problems, no no concerns, no worries. Ask them that, that person they're attracted to, there's nothing wrong with them. That's the perfect person. And then about a year or two after they get married, guess what? They start seeing all the warts. Oh, I didn't realize you were like this. I didn't know you did that. I didn't, huh. And then they start finding the problems. How many of you know that husbands and wives sometimes argue and fuss? Right? And and the husband and wife get in an argument, does that mean that because they got in an argument, they're automatically divorced? No, they're still married. They may not have uh, harmony in that home, but they're still married, amen? And just because you do wrong and sin against Christ don't mean that you are not saved either. Amen? Now, it's not wise to continue in sin. That's a dangerous road to head down. You don't need to play with sin. You can't sin and win. Amen? But just because you fall into Satan's trap don't mean that God can't use you. It don't mean that you can't serve Him. It don't mean that you can't be the best Christian that God intended for you to be. Amen? And so you see how these passages are encouraging us. There's still a battle that we have to face. There's still development that's necessary in the Christian life. There's still an effort that you and I have to put forth. We can't just take salvation and then, well, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. We still have to develop and grow and be on guard. Remember what Paul said to Timothy, take heed unto thyself. Be, be careful. And what did James say? Listen, I mean, let, uh, add to that, engraft that word and make the word a part of your life, the word a part of your life. If you'll do that, then you'll deliver yourself when you fall into all these different tests and trials and troubles that come your way. You're not going to walk away from Christ just because you have a great sorrow. You're not going to turn from Christ just because you're persecuted and in great suffering. You're not going to walk away from Him just because you face some awful sickness. You're not going to turn your back just because that you are tempted to sin. No, you're going to keep on going and keep on growing and keep on becoming what the Lord wants you to be. Amen? Of all those things I mentioned to you tonight, 
The only ones not recorded in our Bible is we never read anything about Jesus being physically sick, do we? But everything else I mentioned to you tonight, and that don't mean that we shouldn't expect to be sick. Please don't misunderstand me. It's amazing how people can hear something and assume I said something I didn't say. Uh, just because it's not recorded that he was sick don't mean that we're never to anticipate getting sick. We've all been sick, haven't we? Some of you are sick tonight. And that don't mean that you're not saved and you're not right with God either. Amen? I'm just saying as we read the Bible, we never see Jesus being sick. But everything else I mentioned to you, he went through those things. He suffered that. He endured that. And he was faithful to God. He didn't quit on his father just because he hit a rough patch in the road. Amen? Don't expect this problem-free Christian living. You live for Christ no matter what you face in this world. Amen? And may God give us the grace to do that. Let's stand for prayer.